Well, good morning. It is Sunday morning. It's Palm Sunday, and it is good for you to join us uh, by internet to uh, our worship service here at First United Methodist Church, North Wiltsboro, uh, our virtual worship service. And thank you for being here. I've got just a couple of announcements to make before we get started. Um, as you know, we are continuing our time of separation uh, as pretty much the country is shut down through the month of April. So continue to tune in to Facebook and other uh, video avenues or other types of communication so we can keep up with you. Uh, we are having a little bit of problems from time to time with Facebook. So some videos that have been there are no longer there because they were linking to some other places that we didn't want you to go to. Uh, so just keep that in mind. We'll try to make sure that our videos uh, are also uploaded to YouTube. You'll be able to watch us there as well. Uh, as the virus now comes into Wilkes County, we're not exactly sure how much longer we'll be able to, to do this type of service uh, live, but we will continue as long as we can. Uh, but we will have something for you every week at 8.45 and 11 o'clock. That's all the announcements I have. And so, friends, this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. want to thank Andy and Rick this morning for providing the music. I'm sure we're probably getting a lot of thanks right now uh, on the internet for that. Got just a couple of announcements, uh, let us, or prayer concerns. Let's continue to be in prayer for uh, the Nichols family as they are waiting for Bobby to continue his slow progression of recuperation from uh, heart surgery and also uh, for um, Jonathan's Fiance Gail Dunbar, who uh, is suffering from brain cancer and, in, as in, and is in hospice. We also continue to pray for uh, the family of Dick Hicks. We had uh, his small private uh, uh, funeral service this past Thursday, so please keep them in your prayers. One of the good things that we did start this past week is we have divided all the active membership into tribes and we have tribe leaders who are given 
uh, families call, just make sure that you're connected to one another. So if you get a call from somebody, uh, take time to talk with them. They're wanting to make sure that you're okay and that you still have all the things that you need uh, to support you in your faith development and faith journey. So just give them a talk, uh, talk with them. Um, I know that you may have some prayer concerns. If you do, please just type those in the comment box and uh, Shannon will make sure that she gets those out to the membership this week by email. But brothers and sisters, let's join together in this time of prayer. Well, gracious God, as we uh, come together on this Palm Sunday, it seems so strange because on this day we're used to coming in with uh, palm branches and, and children singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. But today we're separated. Some of us are watching in our pajamas. Uh, some of us are outside enjoying a cup of coffee, uh, enjoying the great weather that we have here. But God, our hearts are aching because we're not together. But God, you still join us together. You give us this blessing that we can worship at this one time uh, together. And we thank you. And as our county has seen the first virus, I mean, first cases of the virus now here, and we've experienced the first death of it, we're beginning to become even more anxious because we know that we are no longer immune to what goes on in the rest of the world. It is here. So bless us and help us, Father to have the strength, to have the resilience, to, to rise above this. But most of all, God, to put our faith in you. For all of our hope comes from you, and we give you thanks. Now, Father, as we begin this time of Holy Week, as we begin this day with celebration and then progress downward to remember the ultimate sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus, Help us to internalize what was happening. Help us to be a part of what was happening so that when we get to this place next week, a week from today, Easter will have a new meaning that we have never experienced before. True resurrection of life and spirit. So, Father, we pray that you continue to bless us and to continue to hold us in your hands as we are a part that unified in our thoughts and our prayers, and especially this prayer, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> About this time, we would normally have uh, uh, someone come up for our ministry moment. Andrew Casey has got a video for you. We're not able to splice this into this broadcast right now. So about just a couple minutes after noon, it will be published on Facebook. So please check back and hear the ministry moment update from the uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee. But right now, friends... We invite you to give back to God what is God's as you give your tithes and offerings. You may go to the church's website, firstnw, that is F-I-R-S-T-N-W dot org. Look down a little bit and find the box that says make a donation. It'll take you to a secure website where you're able to make a donation online and uh, it'll be posted tomorrow. And we thank you so much for your continued giving to the ministries of this, your church, as we uh, continue to find new ways to reach out and to make Jesus real. 
in a very different world. I did just get a couple of prayer updates I'd like to update you on. Uh, Gail Dunbar, the fiance of Jonathan Nichols, she passed away yesterday. So please keep Jonathan and all the Nichols family and Gail's family in your prayers. And also uh, Mary Lou Eldridge, mother, Joan Jacobus, uh, suffering from late Alzheimer's. So please keep... Uh, Mary Lou in your prayers as well. Today we're celebrating Palm Sunday and sometimes it's called Passion Sunday and today it's going to be a mixture of the two because it seems strange that we are not here celebrating this joyous occasion. But let us go back and listen to the words about what it's all about. And I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. You also see that, uh, or we'll see that posted in just a little bit. Hear these words. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there but with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, say the, that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd 
spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches of trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna to the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. As we prepare our uh, our hearts for this time of reflection, I'd like to encourage us to join together in a time of prayer. And so if you will, just hold your hands out, uh, palms up, as we assume a, a posture of expectancy. And pray this prayer with me. Lord, I offer myself to you. Open my ears to hear hear. and my heart to receive receive. all you have for me today. today. In Jesus' name I pray. pray. Amen. Amen. You know, Palm Sunday is often described uh, by Christians for generations as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, if if this was such a triumphal entry, then why did Jesus' closest friends desert him by the end of the week? And why did the crowd go from shouting, Hosanna to the highest heaven to crucify him within just a few short days? Well, something you may not know was that Jesus' procession into Jerusalem on that day was not the only one that happened. History records that in the year 30 AD, the governor of Judea, Pius Pilate, was, led a procession of Roman cavalry and centurions into the, Jerusalem as well. Now, imagine the spectacle of that entry. From the western side of the city, that is the opposite side from where Jesus enters, Pontius Pilate leads Roman soldiers on horseback and on foot, and each one of the Roman soldiers was clad in leather armor, and each centurion wore a a, a, a helmet, a uh, a hammered helmet upon his head, and at their sides there were swords crafted from the hardest steel, In their hands, each centurion carried a spear, and each archer carried a bow with a sling of arrows across his back. You see, it was standard practice for the Roman governor of a foreign territory to be in the capital for religious celebrations. And and this was the beginning of the Passover festival, which was a strange Jewish festival, at least in the Romans' minds. But they allowed it. But they knew what they were celebrating. The Jews celebrated the liberation, or their liberation from another empire, Egypt. So Pilate was there in Jerusalem because he had to be. Since the Romans had had occupied this land by defeating the Jews and disposing of their king about 80 years before, uprisings were always a possibility. The last major uprising had been about 30 years before this time, so somewhere right around year one. And the uprising had started in Sepphoris, but before it was over, that town and the town of Emmaus had been completely destroyed by the Roman army. And after putting down the rebellion there, the Romans marched on to Jerusalem. And there they crucified 2,000 Jews who were accused of being part of the rebellion. You see, the Romans made sure that there was no question that there was going to be no tolerance for any rebellion. So here it was. Pilate was riding in with this big army contingent. Some of Rome's finest soldiers into Jerusalem just to make the point. 
Jerusalem was teeming with Jews at that time because they were there to participate in the Passover festival. And Pilate's ar- Pilate was entry was, was meant to send a message to the Jews that those who might be plotting against the Roman Empire don't even try it. It was meant to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem themselves who might think twice now about joining such a rebellion. But like I said, this was a day of two processions. The other being Jesus. Now Pilate's procession meant to show military might and strength. Then Jesus' procession was meant to show the opposite. Both Matthew and Mark record Jesus uh, Jesus' own words as he instructs his disciples to go to the city and find a donkey tied up there. And if any were to if they were to ask the owner if if they may use the donkey, they are to say to the owner, the Lord needs them. Then Jesus quotes from Zechariah chapter nine. He says this Say to the daughter Zion See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But you know what? There's more to the passage than just this description of the means of transportation for that day. Zechariah 9, or in Zechariah 9, the prophet speaks to the nation and reassures the the Jews, the people of Judah, now called Judea in the New Testament, that God has not forgotten them. Listen to these words. This is from Zechariah 9. But I will defend my house against the marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, the daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away chariots from Ephraim and and the war horses from Jerusalem, and, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus' quote from Zechariah reminded those who heard him of the entire passage. The message message they heard was, God will deliver the nation from the oppressor. And in this case, what they were hearing was, God will deliver us from Rome. Yet the king they seek will come humbly, not not on a steed of war, but on a slow-moving donkey, a symbol of one who comes in peace. So think about that for a moment. These two processions, the one on the west side and the one on the east, could not be more different. Pilate leading the Roman centurions a certain power and might of the the empire of Rome which crushes all that opposes it. And Jesus riding in on a young donkey embodying peace that God brings to his people. Now the people of that day had to make a choice. They had to choose either they would serve the God of this world with all of this apparent power and might, or they had to choose to serve the king of a very different kingdom, the kingdom of God. In their book, Leadership on the Line, Authors Marty Linsky and Ron Heifetz define leadership this way. 
Leadership is about disappointing your people at the rate they can absorb. Let me, let me say that again because this is very different than what we think. Leadership is about disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. Friends, this was Jesus' problem. His followers and, and the others who got caught up in his entry into Jerusalem, they think they are choosing to follow Jesus, but by the end of the week, Jesus will have disappointed them at a rate faster than they can stand. So they'll turn on him. Even his closest friends will either betray him outright or abandon him in confusion and fear. It's interesting to note that the crowd on Sunday proclaimed, Hosanna to the, the son of David. In other words, they were, they were placing their faith in Jesus that he would restore the glory of the nation to its splendor when David was was king and, and, and his son Solomon was king and they ruled a unified kingdom. That's what they wanted Jesus to do. They wanted Jesus to, 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 to rule like David. A, a man so committed to, to, to God that the Old Testament prophets for, would foretell of his coming. This, this Messiah would bring back the glory of Israel. He would rid the nation of the, the oppressors. He would rule benevolently and he would turn their world right side up again and would be kind to the common people. Well, Jesus challenged the rulers, but it wasn't the Roman rulers he challenged. Instead, he challenged the Jewish rulers. He said to them that the temple was not the only way to find God's forgiveness. And that the temple would be destroyed and not one stone would be left on another. Now, of course, those who made their living from the temple and the rituals, like the scribes and the, and the priests and the Sanhedrin and, and all those people, uh, they would all lose their power and their prestige if there was no temple. So when Jesus miraculously saves the lame man by first saying, your sins are forgiven, and then healing him, he challenged the authority of the temple system. When, when he drove out the, the money changers from the temple, proclaiming that the temple was to be a house of prayer for all nations and not a den of thieves, Jesus exposed the corruption that existed among the religious right. Jesus disappointed and alienated powerful people. Now his entry into Jerusalem may or may not have been planned to occur the, the same day as Pilate's procession. But whether it was planned or not, the, the two processions provided a contrast that was unmistakable. Now the interesting thing is that Pilate also served the Son of God. Just not the one we're thinking of. The late Emperor Augustus, who ruled from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D., this is the one that you know of, uh, when Jesus was born. Uh, Augustus was said to have been fathered by the god Apollo, so the inscriptions referred to him as son of God, thus making him a god. And his successors decided to carry on that tradition and to be referred to and worshipped as gods themselves. Now, a contrast between kings and kingdoms was also on the display that day in Rome. Although many of the common people thought they had sided with Jesus, they, they did 
did so for the same reasons that the Pharisees and the others sided with Rome. They thought that Jesus could do for them what Rome had done for their followers. They thought that Jesus would make their lives better, that, they, that he would deliver them from the oppressive system which they lived and worked. And that's what the crowd, that's why the crowd turned on Jesus by the end of the week. They didn't think he was going to do any of those things. And in addition, they, they, they thought that Jesus was going to make their life worse for them and not better. Their religious leaders, all of them who, who never had agreed on anything, agreed that Jesus was going to attract the attention of the Roman Empire. And especially during this time of Passover, and Rome would come down hard and fast on all of the Jews. So when Jesus is accused, and he's brought before Pilate, the mobs, they wanted to be rid of Jesus. Because in their minds, Jesus never did what they wanted him to do. He never defeated the Romans. He never dissolved the, the unfair tax system. And he never put common people in charge of the government. And furthermore, he never would. So to appease the crowds of the swelled city of Jerusalem, Pilate had this custom of releasing prisoners, many of them who were political prisoners. But on this last week in the life of Jesus, Pilate offered the crowd to make a choice between Barabbas, who was a well-known robber, or Jesus, a failed Messiah. And fearing that Jesus, if, if Jesus were, were to be released, he would start this whole thing again and, 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 and Rome would come down upon the Jews. The crowd begged for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be crucified. Because crucifixion was the one form of capital punishment that would show Rome that the Jews were completely loyal and would humiliate Jesus even in death. Uh, but actually I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's end with this for this moment ask yourself if I'd been in Jerusalem that day and seen both processions passing by which one would I have watched which one would I have chosen to follow Because that's an important question. That's a question we have to ask every day. To choose power and might or peace and love. To choose the way things are done or to choose the way God intends them to be. Two processions. Two theologies. Two choices. Which do you choose? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, every day we do have a choice. To follow the power and might of this world. To look to our elected and appointed leaders. Or to put our faith in you. To follow ways that are tried and true, it seems. Or to trust you with ways that seem 
to be impossible. It comes down to our faith. Even in trying times like this, when even our very lives seem to be in jeopardy, we have a choice to make. So help us to follow you, Lord, in all that we do to trust you to bring us home. And this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We do miss your smiling faces here in the chapel and for the time we can all gather here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his favor upon you and give you peace. Amen. Oh,